Thank you very much, Thomas, for these kind words. And, and thank you for having the opportunity to present in, in front of this uh, audience. So uh, just to give you an outline what I'd like to tell you, I'd like to motivate uh, the research that we do. And I'll be talking about a particular numerical method we develop, and that is particle methods. And I'll be discussing two parts. I'll be discussing particles for continuum flows. And then I will tell you why particles actually cannot exist alone there, but they need also to uh, cooperate with grids. I will also introduce you to uh, a concept that we developed in our lab about wavelet adaptivity for grid-based and particle-based methods. And I will discuss also how can you take uh, complex codes and that have adaptivity as the ones we develop and apply them so that you take advantage of all this beautiful technology that CSCS is providing us. And then I will switch to um, particles for atomistic flows. This probably involves many of you who work on molecular dynamics. And I would like to uh, raise you uh, some uh, um, issues regarding uh, potentials and how to interface um, this type of uh, simulations with continuum solvers. And I would like to conclude. So as a start, uh, and, and the motivation, if you like, of the approach we follow in our lab, um, over the last uh, few years, uh, there have been, last decades, there have been a lot of advances in computational fluid dynamics. And one of the uh, success stories, if you like, of computation is today that every aircraft that is being designed, it has been gone through extensive uh, computational simulations. And people actually trust them and use them very much in the design process. But there's other fields like medicine or uh, biology, if you like, where uh, computation has not made um, the same type of inroads as it has made in uh, aircraft design. And there is a lot of heuristics and data. Um, there is questions about models. And I think there is space there to take ideas from computational fluid mechanics for aircraft, if you like, and apply them in these areas. And this is one of the approaches that we do in our lab. So how we do what we do, uh, we're interested in problems that are motivated from applications. So one of the problems we're interested in is the destruction of aircraft wakes. The reason of this, uh, what are these aircraft wakes? These are vortices that are being shed by aircraft and the reason they fly. And the reason you wait between your flights inside the airplane is that a big airplane takes off and then these vortices get destroyed. Because if you catch yourself uh, in these vortices, then you can flip upside down and allegedly that's how Gagarin eventually uh, died. So the idea is, can we understand the physics of these uh, processes? So we are interested in instabilities of these vertical structures. We're interested in long wavelength instabilities. So you have to do simulations in very big uh, domains. And some of the simulations we were doing back in 2008 involved 16,000 uh, cores. Uh, and then we were the first to cross the billion level uh, of particle simulation for continuum solvers. So there's a Poisson equation there that is being done with 10 billion unknowns. And then we were able to show a weak scalability of up to 60% in arriving to these 16,000 processors and have a lot of insight about the vertical structures of these uh, wakes. Now, as I said, we are interested very much in taking ideas and technology uh, from this field and apply them to other areas. And one other area where fluid mechanics actually is very important is cancer. And the idea of or, or what is the phenomena that we are interested in there in cancer, uh, when cancers, tumors, are, are starting to grow, one of the um, things that starts to happen is the cells at the interior of the tumor, they start to emit, they start to become hypoxic, they don't receive oxygen. And when tissues become hypoxic, they start to emit growth factors. These are similar to growth factors when you cut yourself and you want the blood vessels to grow back and bring oxygen and repair the tissue. These are the similar growth factors that they go to blood vessels and they tell them to grow and to transport oxygen, except that tumors, they co-opt this mechanism of the body and they do two things. First of all, they uh, are able to attract oxygen. Then the vasculature um, they develop is leaky and there's a lot of fluid that is going around the area of the tumor and you cannot uh, do chemotherapy. And finally, the particles that you see in there these are tumor cells that are using um, the blood vessels in order to metastasize. And 90% of the people who die, they die because of metastasis, not of the primary tumor. And these blood vessels, this is a real picture of blood vessels around a tumor. 
So what we do is we take some of the ideas we have learned in, in, in fluid mechanics, and, and it's actually a very interesting uh, problem there. First of all, you have to be able to simulate the vasculature of the blood vessels that are bringing oxygen to the tumor. Um, then you have to be able to model the tip cell. The tip cell is the cell that propagates and investigates where the should blood, blood vessels should grow, and then it proliferates behind and leads to the vasculature. You have to consider that the blood vessels, they are not moving inside a void, but they are moving inside a very interesting porous material, which is the tissue between the tumor and the original blood vessels. This is the extracellular matrix that has this fibrous type of composition. And finally, you have to take into account that there is chemical signals that are interacting between um, proteins or other growth factors that exist on the tissue, that exist on the extracellular matrix, and also with these are the, the chemical factors that they signal to the cell to which direction, to the blood vessels to which direction to propagate. So we have been taking, as I said, technology from fluid mechanics. We are reconstructing the extracellular matrix, and we are able to solve reaction, diffusion, convection type of equations inside very complex geometries, like this extracellular matrix, and then to do simulations, extensive simulations of the propagation of vessels. Of course, after that, you have to interact with experimentalists to see how much of this is correct, but I will come uh, to that. Now, the technique that we are using and which I advocate uh, in this talk is called particle methods. And many of you know particle methods in, with different names. So many of you can recognize here molecular dynamics. And this is the case where you have discrete particles, each one uh, representing an atom of a water molecule over an aquaporin, as you see over there. Uh, we have been using them in something called vortex methods to do simulation around swimming organisms. And people in astrophysics, uh, they have been using extensively a technique called smooth particle hydrodynamics to study galaxy uh, formations. So what is unique about particle methods? I think you can do um, these simulations over here with grid-based solvers. The same thing can be done here. This, you cannot do grid-based solvers. But what is unique, it gives you a unifying description of physical phenomena over 18 orders of magnitude. And as far as I am concerned, there is no other numerical method, finite element, finite differences, or such, that they can do uh, this spanning of scales uh, that this method is, is able to do. Of course, the interesting story is what happens between the gaps and how you can couple between the scales. But nevertheless, this approach that you can have a numerical method and simulate phenomena across scales, I think, is an interesting one. So what is the basis for this? What are particles? So particles are uh, owing, actually, their capabilities in the fact that they are very simple. Particles are computational quantities, and, and what they do is they move. So you can have different ways on how they move. Here they can move according to a certain velocity field. So if you have computational elements, you have to move them in this way, and now where do you get the velocity field? If you're doing continuum uh, simulations, you get the velocity field by solving the Navier-Stokes equations. This is the Lagrangian form of the Navier-Stokes equations. In fact, if you change the stress tensor on the right, you can also model uh, solids if you like. So I will be showing you some simulations of vortices, or similar to what you saw before. And now you see I have computational elements that are not stationary, but they are moving, and they are tracking here uh, the vorticity field. Now, perhaps the most popular way of using particle methods is for discrete type of simulations. So here what we have is we have, again, Newton's equation of motion. That's what's common in both of these uh, domains here. And here you have a force field. Here you get the force field by the divergence of a stress tensor. Here you get a force field by ways that we know, by taking certain uh, potentials, by comparing with experiments. And then there's techniques like molecular dynamics, dissipative particle dynamics, coarse grain molecular dynamics. The simulation that you just saw is concerning us. Uh, we're trying to see how can particles or nanoparticles be intaken by lipid bilayers. And this is a coarse grain molecular dynamics simulation. There is the coating with hydrophobic, hydrophilic components. And we try to see how is this being taken in um, by the domain. So again, um, what is the, this, this 18 orders of magnitude that I described earlier? And this idea that particles here, they're solving Newton's equation of motion, is something we try to explode. And, and, and in fact, what we exploit, and in fact, what is different in these different simulations is the right-hand side. 
So there is a lot of, of common modules in these simulations across scales. So the time integrators, maybe we can have certain uh, geometrical constraints we like to preserve, and then we are choosing accordingly time integrators. We have to find out who are the particles that we are interacting, and there are different interactions for far and close. We both have Poisson solvers for electrostatics in the atomistic and for the flow field in continuum. We have fast summation algorithms, and as I will tell you, we have particle mesh type of interactions that we have to take into account. So all these five, or actually six type of, of, of abstractions or of modules that I have, these are what is in the core, what is in the engine of the particle solvers, and then we put them together in different combinations and we try to do simulations across scales, and that's actually what is interesting about this particle uh, framework. So now let's start by some of the uh, simulations for continuum flows. Uh, what you see in front of you, I think, is the largest uh, direct numerical simulation in vortex dynamics that has ever been made, and this is done by using, uh, by doing a Reynolds number of 10,000 people. They have been uh, studying how vortices are reconnecting. This is one of the clay millennium problems, actually, to study the singularity of the Navier-Stokes equations. And what people have been observing so far is the first reconnection, uh, but what we did is actually, after the first reconnection, people thought that these vortices die, but actually this is not the case. What happens, they induce a certain swirl inside the core of the vortices, and this induces into a secondary vortex breakdown. And then there is a question, if we pump up the Reynolds number, do we find the mechanism to turbulence when that is that you have vortices, as they collide, they part swirl to each other, and then as they do that, they keep colliding until you get to the final, to the dissipation of all these fine structures you observe uh, here. Um, now, what is the grid that is behind this? These are the particle methods that I have been telling you. So this is what we have been using. And I want you to pay attention that the location of the particles here are not completely berserk. They don't fly all over the place. They are adaptive, but you will see that they have a certain uh, regularity. So what is the issue with particle methods? Um, so the issue with particle methods and what do they do? You have a continuum quantity and what you do is you write it as a convolution with delta functions. And now you can go ahead and discretize this integral to put it in the computer and you get point particle approximations. Now if you want to know information between the point particles, you do smooth particles and then you take the delta function, you approximate it by a smooth function and then you have smooth particle quadratures. So you have two length scales in particles. You have the classical distance between computational elements, and that's what also finite difference, <coughs> finite volume, finite element methods have. But here you have also one more scale, and that is the size of your computational elements. So there is distance between computational elements and size. When you do finite difference methods, this is one and the same. In this case, this is not one and the same. And the issue here is actually that you get two errors because of this approximation. The first has to do with how well the smoothing kernel approximates the delta function, and that is a, an error that corresponds only to the smoothing. And the second error is, is very serious, and it tells you that if the distance between your particles is larger than the size of your particles, the method does not converge. Okay, and, and people have proven that theoretically and mathematically, nevertheless, people do simulations without respect in mathematics. And, and here is an example where, um, where we are looking at a very simple benchmark study. And the simple benchmark study is you take the Navier-Stokes, you forget the viscosity, it's okay if you keep it actually, and then you are looking for an exact solution of these equations. So there is an exact solution of these equations, except that it is very boring is you have a very a circular vortex, and then the circular vortex remains circular. That's what it is. Now, if you take your favorite particle solver, smooth particle hydrodynamics or other solver, that's what happens. And I'll play it a bit here. So this is what your SPH solver will do, and that's actually why SPH is popular in astrophysics. So, <laughs> so, um, so the, the, the story here is that what happens is that the particles, if they go apart, then they stop obeying this overlap rule. This h over epsilon gets larger than 1, and then the method doesn't work. SPH, in fact, works if the particles remain uh, in overlap, and you have cases where this is the case. 
But in case where particles do not overlap and you are using these particles to resolve a critical part of your flow, you're producing things that are not mathematically correct. What is interesting actually with particle methods is that I don't blow up on you. There's nothing to blow up. You're just doing quadrature and integrals. Therefore, it's more difficult for them to understand when you make a mistake. But I just want to put this up so that you can uh, see what is uh, the issue. Um, now, uh, how do we fix that? So to fix that, uh, you have to respect what the mathematics tell you. And what we have introduced a few years back was actually the story of particle remeshing. And this was actually against the dogma that particle methods are mesh-free. But nevertheless, this is what we did. We have particles. We put down a grid. And the grid respects this H is less than epsilon. These are the grid nodes. We perform interpolations of the quantities carried by the particles between grids and nodes. These become the active grid nodes, uh, and eventually this is the interpolation we have accomplished. And eventually we discard the old particles, the orange ones, and we stay with the new particles, and we use those. The grid nodes become particles, if you like. Uh, in fact, the simulations that you see over here, they have been done uh, with this remeshing, and we do get this exact uh, solution of the Euler and the Navier-Stokes equations. We are conserving moments of the interpolation field. So those of you who will ask if it is the method dissipative, et cetera, I can tell you it is not. And actually, it can become of spectral accuracy depending on how fast you interpolate. And then we are using interpolations that are tensorial uh, grids. Um, so what is the method? Uh, I move particles. And then I use this Lagrangian advection. So I can do high CFLs. Then I do particles to mesh. I do Poisson derivatives on the mesh. And then the mesh nodes become particles. This is actually what is new compared to all particle in cell uh, codes that people have been using in the past for, for this type of methods. So we have validated. We compare them with pseudospectral methods. And pseudospectral methods are great for doing um, unbounded flows. And we can show that we actually compete with those. This is one-to-one -one on vorticity for this type of uh, simulations. We actually can compete with finite element methods. And this is a free-falling body. And we can compete with finite volume methods. So we have the capabilities of doing a lot of different things that a single method like pseudospectral or finite elements or finite volume uh, may not be able to do uh, so straightforward. We also have been uh, trying to extend these techniques to computers, modern computers, or whatever is available to us. And I can show you, this is my PhD. Um, this is actually flow uh, past the cylinder at Reynolds number 9,500. And it's a, quite a challenging flow because it generates a lot of structures. And if you don't know where to refine your grid, you will never be able to get it. So this was in 1995. I had one allocation, Cray YMP. I had 20 days, and I either succeeded or not. And this is what was the way you compute it in those days. And today, my students, they can do this in 100 seconds. So you have tremendous capabilities to do parametric studies. You have tremendous capabilities for engineering, thanks to this technology. Of course, about a factor of 100 comes by letting time go by. But there is a factor of 180 in this case that comes from human ingenuity and learning to use these particular uh, machines. So um, now, this is all great, but there is a problem. And, and those of you who do perhaps um, other grid-based methods may recognize what is the problem here. Could someone tell me what is the problem of this method? So what is the problem of this method is that it is inefficient. And it is inefficient because in the smooth parts of the flow, is using the same size of particles. And when the flow becomes more drastic and requires more resolution, this, this particular technique that I have presented you does not care. It uses the same size of particles. So in fact, we are limited by the finest scales of our flow. And then if we want to resolve the finest scales of our flow, we are using this fine discretization also in the smooth part of the flow. And that's not efficient usage of computing uh, resources. So what do we do about that? So what is the competition doing? The competition is having this technique called adaptive mesh refinement. Wherever you have a fine interface or activity that you want to uh, resolve, what you do is you refine the grid. And, and, and that's actually a very popular method that is uh, supporting also unstructured grids. And you can have different uh, mesh orientations. 
Now there's problems with adaptive mesh refinement, and the problems are that it's usually depending on, on gradients and curvatures. So you refine according to the gradient of your solution and the curvature of your solution. So if you see this from an image processing type of, of approach, this is a low compression rate. That means that if I wanted to represent my image by gradients and curvatures, I'm still going to be using a lot of points. And also, you don't have an explicit control of your compression error when you're using gradients and, and, and curvatures. So can we do better? So a better compression algorithm are wavelets. And the idea of wavelets is that you can represent a certain image with a fraction of, um, of the wavelet coefficients, if you like. And now the logical jump that we made was, can we take this idea from image compression and apply it to the way we construct grids for our flow solvers? So what is the, uh, so that was all actually, and, and what does this mean? It means that you have, at least let's say for particles at the stage where you remesh, you have a vorticity field, and then what you do is you do a wavelet analysis of this vorticity field, or any other quantity of interest, density, or anything else. Now, once you do that, then you start to get wavelet coefficients of this field in the blue level, which is a coarse level, a green level, which is a finer level, and even at the finest, finest level, which is the orange level. Now, what do people do in wavelet compression? What they do is they discard low-level coefficients because these low-level coefficients, they do not give them extra information that they cannot get from coarser discretizations. So that's what we do as well. So we identify a grid point with a wavelet coefficient, and this is now the new grid uh, that we will be having. So we will have here just one particle, if you like, taking over all this area because it simply happens to be a very smooth and constant area. And wherever we need to discretize, this wavelet adaptivity tells us where to refine. How good is this? Well, this is very good. Uh, and this is uh, a simulation on doing wavelet adapted simulations of level sets. So I will not describe what is level set. You can see it as a scalar that is circular, and then you evolve it through a certain field, and then you have to play back the field, and this should go back to the original circle that it was. Now, if you're using uh, any method, you're going to be losing some of the area. Uh, you will not be able to go all the way back up, and that's what is this, the error over here. So this is the state of the art on level set simulations by using grids and some kind of hybrids. And this is what we can get. And you can see that we can be orders of magnitude better, uh, better accuracy with less degrees of freedom. And also, as I said, we are doing Lagrangian advection. So the thing of u delta t over delta x is less than 1 does not apply to us. So we can do very big uh, time steps. So now this is all very nice for unbounded bodies, unbounded domains. I want to tell you also how we take care in case that we have boundaries where we adopt um, simple Cartesian grids because this allows us to do our wavelet adaptivity quite effectively. And what we do is we change um, the governing equations by a forcing term. And this forcing term enforces the boundary conditions. So there's techniques like immersed boundary methods by Peskin and penalization method introduced by Ango. They have different ways of enforcing the boundary conditions. We adopt these techniques in our solvers, and we also adopt now this multi-resolution in the sense that we consider bodies as implicit level set surfaces. And as I told you, with level sets, we can do adaptive multi-resolution. So we can actually increase the resolution in this area. These methods are known to be low order, and by increasing the resolution, we can do highly accurate uh, simulations. So what can we do? Um, this is a simulation that is as efficient as it gets. This is a vortex method with multi-resolution adaptivity. So we only uh, discretize the vorticity field, so we don't do velocity and pressure. On top of that, we have a body that is deforming and self-propelling itself. So there is the issue of flow structure interaction. And this is, I think, one of the most minimum amount of computational elements that you can use. Now, we are interested in single streamers. We are also interested in multiple streamers. And those of you who are familiar with grid-based methods, you may understand the challenge that it would be to grid such a simulation. But for us, it's kind of straightforward. We have multiple bodies. We are interested, actually, in fish schooling and, and what does, how fishes are creating schools. Why do they make schools? But then. We are developing these particular techniques for problems of this kind. Now, a few things about implementation. Um, so what is nice about these wavelet adapted uh, grids? 
So if you take your PDEs, so here is the level sets actually I was talking about earlier, and you discretize them, uh, and then you consider that at some point you're using this wavelet adaptivity, you can actually show that when you carry out certain types of spatial differences, is equivalent to doing image processing and to doing filtering operations. So techniques that exist in the literature, like fast wavelet transforms and the like, we can readily um, use them. But what is actually nice about these wavelets is that when you do um, adaptive mesh refinement, what you're always interested in is you're interest interested in getting the so-called ghosts. So what is a ghost? Now let's say you want to do a central difference operator around this particular grid point. So you need a point on the left from the same discretization and a point on the right. Now the point on the right does not exist because you have a higher, uh, a coarser grid and therefore what you need is you need it at a finer resolution and indeed what the wavelets do, they can give you very, very fast what is this ghost point. So this is a place where we have an advantage actually over uh, adaptive mesh refinement uh, techniques. The other thing that we do is we try to make a compromise between adaptivity and the block structure of the grids that we are using. And I will tell you in a second why we are interested in this block structure. So for example, it can be that the wavelet coefficients of this area over here is actually very, very small. But nevertheless, if we see that there is a compromise of the particular block structure of this fine discretization, we keep it. And then uh, when we keep it, we have a lot of regular structures, a lot of block structures. So all our grid is comprised of block structures of different refinement uh, levels. So what this allows us, it allows us actually to do work that we do over here. It's the same as work that we do down here as far as carrying out finite difference operators. So the only thing that's changing is actually the scale of, of the grid. And this is something that you can take out and then all the operations that you do here are similar to the operations you do over here. So this allows you to create um, uh, wavelet blocks. And then these wavelet blocks, what gives us, they give us, we put them together into tokens. And then these tokens, we are actually giving them into GPUs because we want to give a lot of work to our GPUs to do. And if we have all this spatial adaptivity, this is not always a straightforward manner. How do you decompose? work on different refinement levels. Here, we ignore the different refinement levels, and we look at the different blocks as blocks, no matter in which place they are. And then, depending on how many GPUs we have, we create these tokens. Then the GPUs are doing whatever operations they have to do on these blocks. We go back. The CPU has to take out and find out where everybody belongs. And this is how we do these hybrid computations with GPUs and, and, and CPUs. So the CPU does the clever decomposition of the wavelet blocks. Then we create these tokens. GPU does these vectorized uh, processes. And then we go out and we unfold and put back in space what we need to do. So the overall reduction of time to solution is 1,000. And now keep in mind, this is a complex algorithm. This is not a uniform grid. It's a grid that has multiple resolutions with wavelet adaptivity. And on top of this implementation, we get a factor of 1,000. How do we get this factor of 1,000 compared to a single-threaded CPU solver? First of all, we introduce algorithmic improvements in the sense that every block has its own time step in which operations are taken into place. And this gives you some constraints in the time synchronization you have to do between the quantities that are evolved in the different grids. Then the CPU optimization, uh, this has been done, uh, has been extra effort. How do you reconstruct them? and you get another factor of 1.8. If you have uh, TBB, gave us a factor of 8 over 12 cores. And then finally, the GPUs as accelerators gave us a factor of 3, which is actually what you should usually expect from a, a GPU. It's 1 to 10, perhaps, the acceleration it can give you. So you see that we have algorithmic advantages. We have advantages from the multi-cores, and we have advantages from the GPUs. And when you put all this together, you get this factor of 1,000 over this single-threaded uh, implementation. So this is the first way that we measure performance from time to solution and acceleration of a factor of 1,000. Another type of performance that we are very much interested in uh, is the roofline model. And this is the idea of trying to look at the particular kernels that you are using and at the particular machine where you try to apply them. 
So there's two things that you have to consider. The first one is the performance, and that's the usual gigaflops. And then the different machines, they have a different plateau of the gigaflops that they are using. But now comes the other question, what kind of a code do you have? So do you buy always the fastest machine for the code that you have or not? And now the question is, what is the operational intensity or what is the signature of your code on this diagram? How many operations do you do per byte that you get uh, from the memory? So this is flops per byte, and that's the particular kernel that you're using. And these roof lines, these types of, this is the bytes per second, actually, if you do uh, this calculation. So these lines, actually, you get them from every uh, hardware by doing some very simple benchmarks. So now the question is, where is your code and what should you do? Obviously, if you have a roof line that is more to the left, it would be much more easier to program. And as the roof line starts to go more to the right, it starts to get more and more difficult to program. And this is some of the results that we get. Um, so for example, computing the right-hand side of our solvers, we have uh, operations that are using a lot of flops per byte. But then there's other um, operations like computing surface tension or doing updates on the locations of our particles or how we do diffusion, et cetera, that are not in of high operational uh, intensity. But what, of course, saves us is the particular percentage of all these different kernels that our code is having. So this actually roof line diagram gives us the opportunity to understand where is the critical areas of our code. And obviously, we always try to put the higher percentage uh, CPU that is being used on the kernels to the right. That's not always successful, but at least it tells us where to put some of our effort. Now, finally, the third performance that I will show you, this is comparison with a code that has been developed in a national lab. So to do this adaptive mesh refinement solvers, the, I think it's the Lawrence Livermore, or the Lawrence, no, Lawrence Berkeley National Labs, Colella and his co-workers, they developed a package that's called Chombo. And you have to keep in mind that this is work by National Lab over about 10 years. So we run an adaptive mesh refinement simulation of a shock bubble interaction. And adaptive mesh refinement is actually tricky because you have to make sure that the wavelet adapted grids and this AMR grids, they're using about the same number of points. This is wavelet adaptivity. This is AMR-like adaptivity. But we played with all these things to have a fair comparison. So Chombo uh, takes 91 minutes and 230 megabytes of memory. We're using 56 minutes, 244. And then when we actually apply our GPU acceleration, we have a seven minute um, uh, uh, time. So we are actually an order of magnitude less than Chombo. And this is work that has been done in about a year by two people by following all these very simple and, and, and practices and all these block structures that we are uh, developing. So, yeah. No, no, same year. Same year, same machine. That's, uh, yeah. And we check with our own benchmarks to check that we actually are doing it correctly and within the times they specify. So this is the only question was that it's not always possible to have the same number of grid points. But this is within a factor of 1% of each other in the number of grid points that you have as you go. Uh, so that's the... So this is our comparison, of course. There's always, Chombo should run our code and, and see what they get. But yeah, we are very happy to, to have such things happening. So I want to show you some results. So this is actually not particles, but this is finite volume solvers, but with wavelet adaptive grids. And what you see here is you see on the fly how the grid is adaptive. And this is density of the shock bubble uh, interactions at Mach number uh, 3. And we compare uh, with other uh, numerical methods. This is how fast the front point is propagating of the bubble. And this is how fast the back point is propagating of the bubble. And we are spot on, except that we're using uh, very few computational points. We are trying to be, we're taking advantage of the wavelet uh, adaptivity. And this is actually some of our more recent simulations. Um, we actually don't do here adaptive grids, but we wanted to calibrate our adaptive grids with uniform grids and try to see what's the highest performance we can ever get. That's going to appear in supercomputing in 2012. And what is interesting is we are using 47,000 cores, 30% of the peak of Monte Rosa. And I think we have an unprecedented 250 billion computational elements. And, and I say this to Thomas, if I had a larger machine, I think we can break the frontier of 1 trillion just to, to show that that we can do it. 
And then you can spend a lot of time, and my students do, uh, doing all these beautiful visualizations and trying to understand what is the structure of this sock bubble uh, interaction. But again, you don't see a movie, you see a fly through because the data that you start to get are quite uh, tremendous. Another of the things that we do, uh, by having this capability of doing simulations very fast and doing a lot of interesting uh, boundary uh, problems with boundaries, we start to ask questions about um, natural uh, creations, and we start to ask the question here, is nature optimal? And, and in what sense? I'm actually asking, are the birds optimal flyers? Are the fish optimal swimmers? So we always try to imitate nature, but perhaps we can even do better than that. So what we did is we took a, a zebrafish embryo and we discretized uh, the body uh, from images and experimental results. And now these guys, they, we looked at one particular behavior of a natural system. We look at the behavior of how these little fish are escaping. So this is one of these zebra fish. The movie has been slowed down. And you can see uh, that this is very high. I don't remember how many frames a second. But you can see that this guy, the, the camera, is losing the guy as it accelerates. So what these guys do is they always bend their body into a sea and they escape. And the accelerations they achieve by that are 10G. So fighter pilots, they do 4G in air. This is 10G in water. This is an amazing uh, uh, device that nature has. So we were interested to see, is this optimal? So we said, OK, we start with this geometry. And, and we don't specify the motion, but then we carry out an optimization. We carry out an optimization where we optimize distance covered over a certain time. We're using these evolutionary optimization techniques. This requires thousands of iterations. And that's how we have been spending our time in CSES. But then after you run all these optimizations, this is what's the optimum that's coming out. And, and what's coming out actually is indeed the C start. So in that sense, these guys, they have found an optimum. And that's the, all the vorticity. And we can analyze why actually this particular structure is, is optimum. In fact, so that you can tell you very briefly, what these guys are doing is they're using their whole body to push water out of the way. It's not about vorticity and all these kind of philosophical things. You basically push things out of your way. So they're using their whole body to just eject fluid out of their way. And then they're getting out of the harm's way of the vorticity that the fluid is producing. And I think it's the first time that someone understands that vortices are not so crazy and everything. But it's just they're doing a very simple thing, except that they're using their whole body to do it. And this is a comparison between the center line and the evolution of the center line of the body. This is the experimental results. This is two-dimensional simulations. And this is 3D simulations. And you can see that the elongated vortices of the 3D are closer to what people are observing experimentally than these tightly bound vortices of the, of the 2D. So um, now we can push this thing further. So we can do boundaries. But now someone says, what if you come up and you have actually uh, uh, the same way experimentalists have a microscope, we now have a computoscope. So what is the computoscope? The computoscope is something that you can keep refining, refining, refining. So you go all the way down. And, and you arrive at a level on the surface where you start to take into account material properties. And then there, you're doing molecular dynamic simulations. So we have been looking, actually, into coupling continuum solvers with atomistic solvers. And actually, we have been looking into atomistic solvers that are not trivial, argon or such. But this is a buckyball with water around it and inside a continuum uh, domain. Now, here, we're going to switch quickly uh, gears, very quickly, actually, to raise an issue about molecular simulations. So for molecular simulations, I want to tell you a problem that we have. And this is a problem that perhaps simulations have or experiments have. So carbon nanotubes, they have been argued as devices that they can allow for very fast water transport. So what is this very fast water transport? Is if you take a pipe and then you do a simple uh, Poiseuille flow, then you can know, depending on the size of the pipe and the pressure gradient that you have, how fast the flow can go through. So this is the so-called expected flow velocity if you have the size of the nanotube. And these are experiments where they observe at least 10 or 4 orders or 5 orders of magnitude more than what the, um, uh, the theory will give you. 
This was in Nature, and there was a following paper in Science, where they're actually getting same type of enhancements up to the order of 10,000. And just to make things worse, there is periodic simulations that they do this type of a flow, but then the enhancement that they get is 200. It's two to three orders of magnitude less. So the question is, what is going on? So we wanted to answer a couple of questions. How does the water go inside? Are periodic simulations correct? So we did some heroic simulations, and that's actually thanks to capabilities at CSES. Here is these simulations run in NumD, and this is a simulation of one micrometer nanotube. This is, imagine a nanotube has sizes of nanometer in diameter, and then we have done one micrometer in length. And now you can ask, why did you do one micrometer in length? And again, I tell you, experiments give you one result and simulations another. Now, this is the results of the experiment so that have been reported. And what we observe here, the number here is enhancement over the classical fluid uh, mechanics. And this is the length of the nanotubes that these guys have been using. So if you do small scale molecular dynamic simulations, you start to get uh, this kind of results. This is different types of simulations. So actually, you are tempted to draw a straight line and say the experiments are correct except that I was not able to do the simulations at these length scales. But you have a problem about the periodicity. If you do a periodic simulation, that tells you that this is what happens at very long scales. So we started pushing it and doing longer nanotubes, and longer nanotubes, and what we find at even longer nanotubes is that actually we start to uh, converge towards the periodic solution and that there is a problem with the experiments. Of course, when you submit this paper to Science and Nature, they tell you go and submit in a topical computational journal, except that now we have one more data point that comes from experiments that actually tells you that the enhancement rates are not up there, but they are down here. And actually, we are very confident that there is a problem with this particular experimental uh, results. And that's what we are actually fighting to convince them about the credibility of the MD uh, simulations. Which gives me to the last point I want to make about the credibility of simulations. And as you all know, molecular dynamic simulations, they have a lot of uncertainties in them. And one of the uncertainties that they have is when we do water and graphene, is what is the potential between water and graphene? So we are interested in this factor between epsilon and this uh, oxygen uh, carbon. And, and then we have to worry about the following uncertainties. Modeling, parametric, computational, and finally, the measurement uncertainty. So to calibrate the results of the MD simulations, there are people who have done experiments of water droplets on graphene. And we did actually simulations of water droplet on graphene. This is old work. And I told my students, go ahead, find some potentials from the literature and do it. And then they came back and they gave me these results. If there is this paper by us, we actually did quantum mechanics simulations. And that's what contact angle do you get for the graphene for this particular CO interaction potential. There is this paper that gives you another contact angle. There is this paper that gives you another contact angle, another contact angle, and another contact angle. So these are all molecular dynamic simulations with a CO interaction potential. So who is correct? So what we did as engineers, we noted, actually, you can see with your eyes that there is a pattern. And the pattern is, if you vary this thing, there is a linear relationship between this binding energy and the contact angle. Look for an experiment. This is an experiment done in the 1940s. And there, the contact angle is 86. And that's a value of, of everybody actually is using today, thanks to our work, this particular value. Question is, is this correct? And we actually have to put, and we are looking into this Bayesian uncertainty quantification and propagation framework. We are actually, we are interested in looking at data and then by using this Bayesian inference, try to come up with probability distributions for the parameters of the computational model. And then once you have this probability distribution, then you try to do predictions as to what can happen by these particular interactions to other problems such as buckyball interactions. So here are some of the results to tell you. So here is two parameters in an MD problem. This is the epsilon CO, and this is the cutoff, and this is a, a measure of the likelihood for reproducing this particular contact angle of the 1940s experimental data. And you see that actually no matter what cutoff do you use, you get basically the same result. And the data actually centers around this particular value 
that has the highest likelihood for reproducing this experiment. Now we take this probability distribution and we produce probabilistic results as to the potential of mean force for the interaction of two buckyballs. And what does this mean? It means that if you had used a potential value over here, you would be reporting that buckyballs do not aggregate and therefore they are not toxic, etc. Or you can produce this type of results where you aggregate. So the story is that you actually have to go back and ask for more data because this type of, of, of discrepancies that you have here is not acceptable. So I think this is an issue that all particle methods have and that's something actually we need to address. So particles, um, I think it's a robust and accurate method for multiphysics. It has a lot of computational modules that are common across scales. Uh, we have introduced this multi-resolution and HPC implementation. And we actually would be very interested to interact with people who are computer scientists or are interested in programming languages to take into account all these abstractions and write a language for particle methods, not for flow solvers, but for particle methods because we can use them across scales. And finally, as I said, there is an issue with all our simulations. We look at it in MD. And that's what we try to address. I'd like to thank some people. I'd like to thank Jens Walter and Philippe Chatelain. Uh, they have been for us for a long time, and they were responsible for all of the vortex methods. Michael Bergdorf developed this wavelet adaptivity. And Diego is our magician with GPUs, CPUs, and anything that goes. Babak is his disciple. And Vim and Mattia are doing all the um, fish simulations, and Florian has been working on this cancer computations. I'm sorry, I went six minutes overboard, and thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> you have to be able to simulate the vasculature of the blood vessels that are bringing oxygen to the tumor. Um, then you have to be able to model the tip cell. The tip cell is the cell that propagates and investigates where the blood, blood vessels should grow, and then it proliferates behind and leads to the vasculature. You have to consider that the blood vessels, they are not moving inside a void, but they are moving inside a very interesting porous material, which is the tissue between the tumor and the original blood vessels. This is the extracellular matrix that has this fibrous type of composition. And finally, you have to take into account that there is chemical signals that are interacting between um, proteins or other growth factors that exist on the tissue, that exist on the extracellular matrix, and also with these are the, the chemical factors that they signal to the cell to which direction, to the blood vessels to which direction to propagate. So we have been taking, as I said, technology from fluid mechanics. We are reconstructing the extracellular matrix, and we are able to solve reaction, diffusion, convection type of equations inside very complex geometries, like this extracellular matrix, and then to do simulations, extensive simulations of the propagation of vessels. Of course, after that, you have to interact with experimentalists to see how much of this is correct, but I will come uh, to that. Now, the technique that we are using and which I advocate uh, in this talk is called particle methods. And many of you know particle methods in, with different names. So many of you can recognize here molecular dynamics. And this is the case where you have discrete particles, each one uh, representing an atom of a water molecule to 60% in arriving to these 16,000 uh, processors and have a lot of insight about the vertical structures of these uh, wakes. Now, as I said, we are interested very much in taking ideas and technology uh, from this field and apply them to other areas. And one other area where fluid mechanics actually is very important is cancer. And the idea of or, or what is the phenomena that we are interested there in cancer, uh, when cancers, tumors, are, are starting to grow, one of the um, things that starts to happen is the cells at the interior of the tumor, they start to emit, they start to become hypoxic, they don't receive oxygen. And when tissues become hypoxic, they start to emit growth factors. These are similar to growth factors when you cut yourself and you want the blood vessels to grow back and bring oxygen and repair the tissue. These are the similar growth factors that they go to blood vessels and they tell them to grow and to transport oxygen, except that tumors, they co-opt this mechanism of the body, and they do two things. First of all, they uh, are able to attract oxygen. Then the vasculature um, they develop is leaky, and there's a lot of fluid that is going around the area of the tumor, and you cannot uh, do chemotherapy. And finally, the particles that you see in there, 
these are two more cells that are using um, the blood vessels in order to metastasize. And 90% of the people who die, they die because of metastasis, not of the primary tumor. And these blood vessels, this is a real picture of blood vessels around uh, a tumor. So what we do is we take some of the ideas we have learned in, in, in fluid mechanics, and, and it's actually a very interesting uh, problem there. First of all, your simulations, and people actually trust them and use them very much in the design process. But there is other fields like medicine or uh, biology, if you like, where uh, computation has not made um, the same type of inroads as it has made in uh, aircraft design. And there is a lot of heuristics and data. Um, there is questions about models. And I think there is space there to take ideas from computational fluid mechanics for aircrafts, if you like, and apply them in these areas. And this is one of the approaches that we do in our lab. So how we do what we do? Uh, we're interested in problems that are motivated from applications. So one of the problems we're interested in is the destruction of aircraft wakes. The reason of this, uh, what are these aircraft wakes? These are vortices that are being shed by aircraft, and the reason they fly, and the reason you wait between your flights inside the airplane is that a big airplane takes off, and then these vortices get destroyed, because if you catch yourself uh, in these vortices, then you can flip upside down. And allegedly, that's how Gagarin eventually uh, died. So the idea is, can we understand the physics of these processes? So we are interested in instabilities of these vertical structures. We're interested in long wavelength instabilities. So you have to do simulations in very big uh, domains. And some of the simulations we were doing back in 2008 involved 16,000 uh, cores. Uh, and then we were the first to cross the billion level uh, of particle simulation for continuum solvers. So there's a Poisson equation there that is being done with 10 billion unknowns. And then we were able to show a weak scalability of a fuel over an aquaporin, as you see over there. Uh, we have been using them in something called vortex methods to do simulation around swimming organisms. And people in astrophysics, uh, they have been using extensively a technique called smooth particle hydrodynamics to study galaxy uh, formations. So what is unique about particle methods? I think you can do um, these simulations over here with grid-based solvers. The same thing can be done here. This, you cannot do grid-based solvers. But what is unique, it gives you a unifying description of physical phenomena over 18 orders of magnitude. And as far as I am concerned, there is no other numerical method, finite element, finite differences, or such that they can do uh, this spanning of scales uh, that this method is, is able to do. Of course, the interesting story is what happens between the gaps and how you can couple between the scales. But nevertheless, this approach that you can have a numerical method and simulate phenomena across scales, I think, is an interesting one. So what is the basis for this? What are particles? So particles are uh, owing, actually, their capabilities in the fact that they are very simple. Particles are computational quantities, and, and what they do is they move. So you can have different ways on how they move. Here they can move according to a certain velocity field. So if you have computational elements, you have to move them in this way. And now where do you get the velocity field? If you're doing continuum uh, simulations, you get the velocity field by solving the Navier-Stokes equations. This is the Lagrangian form of the Navier-Stokes equations. In fact, if you change the stress tensor on the right, you can... Thank you very much, Thomas, for these kind words. And, and thank you for having the opportunity to present in, in front of this uh, audience. So uh, just to give you an outline what I'd like to tell you, I'd like to motivate uh, the research that we do. And I'll be talking about a particular numerical method we develop, and that is particle methods. And I'll be discussing two parts. I'll be discussing particles for continuum flows. And then I will tell you why particles actually cannot exist alone there, but they need also to uh, cooperate with grids. I will also introduce you to uh, a concept that we developed in our lab about wavelet adaptivity for grid-based and particle-based methods. And I will discuss also how can you take uh, complex codes and that have adaptivity as the ones we develop and apply them so that you take advantage of all this beautiful technology that CSCS is providing us. And then I will switch to um, particles for atomistic flows. This probably involves many of you who work on molecular dynamics. And I would like to uh, raise you uh, some uh, um, issues regarding uh, potentials and how to interface um, this type of 
uh, simulations with continuum solvers, and I would like to conclude. So as a start, uh, and, and the motivation, if you like, of the approach we follow in our lab, um, over the last uh, few years, uh, there have been, last decades, there have been a lot of advances in computational fluid dynamics, and one of the uh, success stories, if you like, of computation is today that every aircraft that is being designed, it has been gone through extensive uh, computational